Generally, I've been pretty positive about the future direction of Universal Parks. I've said a lot of good things about their various Jurassic World rides that they've been building across their resorts, I've continued highlighting how incredible The Secret Life of Pets is as a dark ride, and I have a generally pretty positive view of Super Nintendo World, now having experienced it for myself. However, I do think that over the past few months, I have been on a bit of a negative streak, first pointing out the massive maintenance issues with the Jurassic Park River Adventure, and more recently, I've discussed why I think Villain Con Minion Blast is actually pretty terrible, at least from a gameplay perspective. So, as much as I don't want to start criticizing Universal as an overall channel trend, I did very much come to the realization recently that the Wizarding World is beginning to feel a bit stale to me. Now, to be fair, I still do think that the two respective lands, Hogsmeade and Diagon Alley, are fantastic. The Forbidden Journey and Hagrid's are still two exceptional experiences, and while Gringotts is just kind of okay, it's still generally an enjoyable and highly themed ride that benefits from existing within the context of Diagon Alley. The Hogwarts Express is probably the least exciting out of all of these attractions, but it is definitely a uniquely themed way of traveling between the two Orlando parks. So, if these lands still hold up well and the rides are all decently strong offerings, why am I saying that things are getting stale? Well, I have never been a fan of the entertainment, and some of it is actually just a lot of bad filler, which I'll get into later in the video. However, I visited Universal Hollywood for Halloween Horror Nights, both in 2022 and again now in 2023. As part of the offerings, Death Eaters roam around Hogsmeade, which are certainly less scarier than the rest of Horror Nights, but is still a very interesting addition that adds spontaneity to the entertainment offered in this land, something that it lacks during the day. I did manage to miss the Death Eaters that used to roam Hogsmeade in Islands of Adventure, so it's very cool to see them during the actual event in Hollywood. However, if we go over to Halloween Horror Nights in Universal Studios Florida, a new addition as of 2023 is Death Eaters Now and Diagon Alley during the event, which really does make a lot of sense, especially because people have been asking this for a few years now, ever since they premiered in Hogsmeade. With these new experiences, it made me realize that while both iterations of the Wizarding World are generally pretty strong, they actually leave a lot to be desired in terms of entertainment and streetmosphere, which is actually a little strange, because Universal usually does these things pretty well. So today, I want to take a closer look specifically into the entertainment aspect of these lands, and highlight why I think that the Wizarding World needs to seriously consider changing out its entertainment offerings. While Hogsmeade is an interesting and well-realized land, I think that the main appeal for most visitors is Harry Potter and the Forbidden Journey. Obviously, a major dark ride is appealing in and of itself, but I would guess that the majority of people visiting Universal Parks specifically for the Potter franchise want to be immersed in the castle. I think that for a ride queue, it actually manages to deliver on that promise pretty well, and the experience is incredibly atmospheric and engaging because there are so many distinct elements to observe. While Hogsmeade is an interesting location in the books and films, I think that the main appeal for most people is the school of Hogwarts itself, and they want to be in the shoes of the students who attend. Naturally, I think it makes sense that in terms of entertainment, the land itself would offer shows that relate to the school, and on a stage adjacent to the castle, there are two entertainment offerings that play throughout the day. The first of these shows is the Frog Choir, which brings out students accompanied by frog puppets sitting on cushions. The conducting student of the Frog Choir introduces their group, and then proceeds to launch into the first song. The show itself is essentially an a cappella performance, with the students accompanied by the throaty bass sounds of the frogs, and the songs themselves are diegetic pieces found in the films themselves, such as the Hogwarts March, which is played by the band in the Goblet of Fire. Now, I'm not saying that these performers aren't talented, but when you have such a spectacular land like Hogsmeade with two incredible, industry-defining rides, you would think that the entertainment would consist of a bit more than just a singing frog show. I think that musical performances certainly have their place in theme parks as general streetmosphere, and are especially welcome in a place like Main Street USA, but I don't think that this performance is really living up to the standard of the rest of the land, and is unfortunately just filler, 
something that I've heavily criticized the shows in Avengers Campus of being guilty of. However, while the Frog Choir is inoffensive at the very least, I do actually have a larger issue with the second show, the Triwizard Spirit Rally. Here, the host introduces students from visiting schools for the Triwizard Tournament, with graceful ladies from Bobaton and burly men from Durmstrang, with their performances clearly inspired from the film. Now, if I may go on a bit of a small rant here, I've never been a fan of these films because there are massive discrepancies in quality between them, and the world building is often incredibly messy because changes are made for absolutely no reason. Why is Voldemort a ridiculous, goofy clown when he should be this dark and intimidating villain? Why was Michael Gammon directed to aggressively scream at Harry in the Goblet of Fire? It's so out of character that it naturally became a meme. I can't get over that Professor Flitwick is just a completely different character for no discernible reason after the Chamber of Secrets, and also, why is he conducting the Frog Choir at the beginning of the school year in the Prisoner of Azkaban? It's made clear that students are out for the summer, so it's not like they had time to rehearse for this performance, nor is there any mention in the books of any classes or extracurriculars related to music. The absolutely messy world building that the films do for the sake of embellishment, regardless of whether they actually make sense or not, has always been a major reason that I've been turned off to them. Out of these, I think that the worst offender is easily the Goblet of Fire, and one thing that I absolutely cannot stand is the students from the other schools. First, it bothers me that Bobaton is just women and Durmstrang is just men, when the books clearly establish a mix of students. And second, their actual wardrobe is ridiculous, especially the men from Durmstrang who are essentially wearing Soviet military uniforms. However, what I really cannot stand to watch is the scene where they burst into the Great Hall, with the women of Bobaton putting on a choreographed yet still remarkably unimpressive performance with some smug sense of arrogance. Worse, they're followed by the men of Durmstrang who do this incredibly cringy dance with a staff that isn't nearly as tough or intimidating as it's intended to be. Also, they break out into a run at the teachers, and one guy literally starts breakdancing in front of them. So essentially, I find parts of these films unbearably difficult to get through because of how downright stupid they can be, and I think this might be the worst scene in the entire series. Going back to the show in Hogsmeade, the Triwizard Spirit Rally is unfortunately the same exact thing. The students from Bobaton perform first, doing a choreographed dance, and are then followed by Durmstrang, doing their unbearable, wannabe tough guy performance with their staffs. Not only is the park adapting one of the dumbest scenes from the films, but the show itself is still essentially filler that adds absolutely nothing exciting to the area. It's frustrating, because in a land themed around a magical school, you would think that there would be shows with a more interesting premise. For an idea off the top of my head, I think that it would be interesting to use this stage for students hosting an illegal dueling club right outside of the castle and away from teachers' eyes, putting on a show that employs stunts and effects such as water or light pyrotechnics to simulate them dueling in a spectacle that must certainly be a bit more exciting than what's currently offered. Again, not that the people performing the current shows aren't talented or that the shows aren't worth watching, but they seem more like passing ambiance rather than a spectacle worthy of such an interesting world. Before we continue into Diagon Alley, if you haven't already done me the favor of hitting the like button, that's something that you can do to help me out and let this video reach a wider audience if you happen to agree with me. Like Hogsmeade, Diagon Alley hosts two shows that share a stage, although I do find these to be a bit more interesting. The first of these is Celestina Warbeck and the Banshees, a musical show that features a singer famous in the Wizarding World, but is only mentioned in passing in the books. After a voiceover introduces her, she comes out singing A Cauldron Full of Hot Strong Love, which was also an offhand mention in one of the books, but is now a fully developed jazz piece for this performance. Around a minute into the song, her backup singers, the Banshees, dance out onto the stage, taking their place at their respective mics and joining her for the remaining two minutes. Throughout, they'll move around the stage and dance, which creates an element of visual interest, and overall, I think that the song is already a stronger start than anything performed by the Frog Choir. At its conclusion, Celestina introduces her version of the Quidditch anthem that she was asked to write for charity, and the Banshees start off up above, singing what sounds like an old college fight song related to Quidditch. Celestina then bursts out, launching into a jazzy continuation of the song, 
and the Banshees move back out onto the stage and dance with Bludger's bats behind her, which makes for another entertaining two minutes. From here, Celestina begins a love song titled, You Charmed the Heart Right Out of Me, and picks an unsuspecting audience member from the crowd to come up and dance with them. Usually, this person is a bit awkward being thrown into the situation, which makes the segment comedic as they're guided around the stage to dance along with the song. Celestina and the Banshees then finish with, You Stole My Cauldron, But You Can't Have My Heart, which is another fun big band piece to finish out the performance with. While I was critical of the Frog Choir on the Hogsmeade stage for being a music show, I do think that Celestina and the Banshees are a much better fit for Diagon Alley because it's an environment that they would more naturally exist in, and I do like that jazz pieces were written specifically for this performance, which builds out the Wizarding World in a way that the Frog Choir does not. I also think that the stage location is a lot more bearable as well, as it's located off to the side of Diagon Alley in Carcat Market, and is under the cover of an arcade that shields from the sun and rain. Unfortunately, if you're going to place the stage in the direct sun in the middle of a major intersection in Hogsmeade and draw a crowd that blocks the pathway, I do think that the entertainment should be more interesting than what's already there. Moving on, the second performance on this stage is the Tales of Beetle the Bard, which introduces the audience to a troupe of thespians who spend the first two minutes of the show walking around and comedically bantering with one another. Once the actors get into place, they introduce the tale of the three brothers, which, if you're familiar with the books or films, tells the origins of the Deathly Hollows. Each of the three thespians now on stage represent a brother each, and the fourth comes out with a wicked puppet, representing the figure of Death himself. The three brothers have managed to conjure a bridge to cross a river, and feeling cheated because most crossers drowned, Death congratulated them, promising them each a prize that he secretly anticipated would lead to them perishing. The first brother wished for an unbeatable wand that could win every duel, and through a sleight of hand magic trick, the representative puppet summons the Elder Wand. The second brother, wanting to humiliate death further, wished for a stone ring that could bring back others to life. The third brother, who knew it was unwise to trust death, asked for a cloak of invisibility that would allow him to disappear without a trace, and begrudgingly, it was handed over. The next segment of the show follows the first brother, and as a chest opens, different stylized slides inside reveal his story. He went to find a wizard he once quarreled with, and with his new invincible wand, easily dispatched him. However, having witnessed the battle, another wizard took the wand from his hand as he slept, and used it against him, allowing death to come and collect the first brother. The story of the second brother then comes into play, using the ring to revive his late fiancée. However, she never belonged back among the living and returned as a specter, miserable as she had been disturbed from her rest. In anguish from not being able to fully reunite, the second brother made the only decision he could and joined her on the other side, playing into Death's hands yet again. The third brother then appears on stage wrapped in his invisibility cloak, having hidden from his fate until he had reached an age where he was ready to move on. He took the cloak off, passed it down to his son, and greeted Death as an old friend, who is now represented as a much larger puppet that dramatically emerges from behind a cabinet. Having concluded their fable, the thespians thank the audience for listening and reset the props around the stage. I think that out of the shows in the Wizarding World, this one is probably my favorite in how it cleverly tells this story, using such interesting elements like puppetry or the various large props. It's also the only show to employ in-universe magic, whether it be through actual sleight of hand magic tricks, or pointing a wand at the props, pretending to reset them. I also think that the tale of the three brothers is an interesting story that added to the narrative in the books and films, and so its presentation is done in a really satisfying way here on stage. Something that I have not yet mentioned is that Hogsmeade has an Ollivander's outpost with an interactive show inside, although I do think that the version in Diagon Alley is more thematically appropriate, so it's the version that I prefer. They're essentially the same show with small differences in the details, but the premise is that small groups of people are pulsed in, and a lucky person, usually a kid, is chosen by the wand keeper to try out different wands. It's dark, atmospheric, and quiet, almost reverently magical, and the chosen person will try out different wands. 
giving them a wave, the wands can create less than satisfactory results where they're aimed, until on the third try, the chosen person lights up as the music swells to signify that they found the right fit. Letting everyone out, they can then peruse the shelves for wands, and while the person chosen doesn't have to buy the one that fit them, I would imagine that most do. While this show isn't very long, it does manage to create a lot of memories for the chosen people, and is a fun thematic way of introducing park guests to purchasing wands, although of course anyone can walk in without the intent to actually buy anything. What the Wizarding World lacks though is spontaneity, and while you can meet with the driver of the night bus or a train conductor for the Hogwarts Express, the presence of Death Eaters for Halloween Horror Nights have really sold me on the idea of spontaneous characters running around and interacting with people. By this, I don't mean specific core characters to the franchise, but rather eccentric shopkeepers or colorful people with their own backstories that make this world feel a bit more fleshed out, including the occasional nefarious actor. Pivoting away from this, I do also think that the lands would benefit from sit-down shows as well. It's heavily rumored that in Epic Universe, its Parisian version of the Wizarding World will include a theater with a sit-down show, that is something akin to a magical circus, which I imagine might be spectacular, since being located indoors allows for a lot more versatility with what effects it may employ. However, the Fear Factor stage right next to Diagon Alley seems like the perfect space for another indoor theater, and with the Lost Continent no longer containing any attractions, Hogsmeade could be extended down to where Sinbad's Bazaar is currently located, building a new theater space for something related to this part of the thematic world. With that said, what might indoor shows in these locations look like? Well, since Diagon Alley is specifically focused on magical shops, it might be interesting to have this theater set in a market where different shopkeepers or sellers come over to showcase their wares. This could include an apothecary who sells magical plants and accidentally unpots a shrieking mandrake. Another shopkeeper could start advertising self-stirring cauldrons, and not paying attention, one potion becomes so volatile that it explodes with a pyro effect as hidden sprinklers above spray the audience. A bookkeeper could roll out a cart on stage, selling a shipment of the invisible book of invisibility, only to realize that they had, well, misplaced them. I'm certainly not that creative of a person, but I think there's potential for a 15 to 20 minute comedic show that deploys a number of special effects among various acts like this, while also building out the lore of this land. If we return to Islands of Adventure, the prevailing rumor at this point is that Poseidon's Fury will be replaced a few years after Epic Universe opens. However, there's not much space for anything in Sinbad's Bazaar, and so I think it naturally makes sense as an extension of Hogsmeade, especially if the current theater show could be replaced with a new one, which is something that Islands desperately needs. While it might be a bit redundant because Hagrid's is already themed around the care of magical creatures, an actual show that uses ambitious puppetry and special effects to showcase other magical creatures might be really cool as well. The first thing that immediately comes to my mind is Hippogriff Magical Lesson, a temporary show that premiered in Hogsmeade and Universal Studios Japan for 2023. It's already a more entertaining show than what's offered in the US, and of course features a pretty good looking pantomime costume to represent the creature. A dedicated indoor theater themed to the woods around Hogsmeade would be perfect for showcasing creatures like this and more, also employing special effects for the more fiery or volatile ones, such as blast-ended scroots or even a fire-breathing baby dragon puppet. These are just a few ideas that might be feasible off the top of my head, but because Universal is really lacking covered sit-down shows away from the heat, I'm of the opinion that these make a lot of sense, especially because there's very little space for anything else to fit into these areas of these parks. So, having now explored the different shows of the Wizarding World, I do think that while they're all essentially filler for the lanes that they reside in, the ones in Hogsmeade are what actually need to be reconsidered. I do like how Celestina Warbeck and the Banshees fit well into Diagon Alley with a fun performance, and the tales of Beetle the Bard present the fable of the three brothers in a really unique and interesting way. Sadly, while the performers in the Frog Choir are talented, the show does feel rather pedestrian and doesn't make sense within the world building of the franchise. I do think the Triwizard Spirit Rally is worse, highlighting what is, in my opinion, even sloppier world building that overvalues embellishment to the point of becoming ridiculous and even cringy. 
So if I can summon up my thoughts for this video, I myself would make three major changes to the entertainment throughout the Wizarding World. First, the current shows on the stage in Hogsmeade need to be replaced with something more exciting, but still relevant to the magic being taught at Hogwarts. Second, the Death Eaters have proven to be popular as spontaneous actors, both around Hogsmeade and Diagon Alley, and so an eclectic range of daytime characters that roam the lands would be welcome additions too. Finally, I've talked about Universal's lack of accessibility before, especially with its focus on thrill rides, and I'm of the opinion that one of the best ways to fix this is to focus on more indoor, sit-down shows. Adding one to both Diagon Alley and Hogsmeade would make a lot of sense for what are otherwise small plots of currently unused space, and there's a lot of potential for really entertaining shows here. Something that I've heard within the industry is that because Universal only licenses the Harry Potter franchise, it's very difficult for any changes to be made. However, I recently observed that they seem to really be expanding with a lot of new merchandise and food items over the past year, and one of my friends suggested that a possible reason for this was AT&T selling Warner Brothers, creating the current entity run by CEO David Zaslov. He speculated that with this, Warner Brothers became much less protective of how the franchise was represented, and was probably open to more ideas proposed by Universal, which would track with the new slate of merchandise and the introduction of the Death Eaters to Diagon Alley. If this is truly the case, then I very much expect to see more changes coming to the Wizarding World in the future, and I hope that as a part of that, Universal really does reconsider its current entertainment offerings, especially in Hogsmeade. So, if you've made it here all the way to the end of the video and haven't yet left a like, that's something that would really help me out. As always, if you like videos like these but have not yet subscribed and hit the bell notification, you can do so now to be alerted to new videos as they release.